Must we obey the law? This is the question that informs all four parts of the series. The first part examined the trial of Socrates. According to Socrates, if enacted by the sovereign and following the correct procedures, a law must be adhered to. Socrates was indirectly subscribing to a theory that was later termed legal positivism. Other theories and theorists explain our relationship to law somewhat differently. In the following clip, we will consider four of these theorists, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and Austin. Thomas Hobbes, a 17th century English philosopher, possessed a rather unfavorable opinion of human nature. According to Hobbes, humans existing in a state of nature are destined to lead lives that are solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. For many humans are power-hungry and greedy, motivated largely by self-interest and selfishness, both of which require dominion over others to be satisfied. In fact, even compassionate and selfless individuals will be forced to adopt the ambitions of their less than savory counterparts, for they will ultimately have to choose between being dominated or taking power. In short, all of us are destined to become moral monsters, whether by preference or by necessity. Hobbes' opinion of the unpleasant nature of human society propelled him to introduce the idea of the social contract. Since the state of nature is such a brutish place, denoted largely by an absence of cooperation, an absence of peace, and an absence of security, individuals can avoid living in perpetual fear by first, creating a state with absolute power, and second, establishing a social contract between individuals and the state. The social contract effectively consists of an agreement between individuals with each other and between individuals and the state. Now, according to Hobbes, the social contract is a trade-off. The state guarantees peace and security in exchange for which individuals agree to submit themselves to the laws of the state. Like Socrates then, Hobbes maintained that individuals should obey the law. Unlike Socrates, however, obedience is not tied to a self-imposed moral duty toward the sovereign, but to utilitarian self-interest. To receive protection from the savagery of the state of nature, humans subordinate themselves to the laws of the state. John Locke, also a 17th century philosopher, endorsed Hobbes' concept of the social contract. Locke is famous for saying that protection from the state of nature allows individuals to stop building fences and to start sowing farms. To Locke, however, the state of nature is not as hideous as Hobbes suggests. For instance, instead of abduction, robbery, and murder, he was more concerned with the challenge of locating in nature neutral judges capable of resolving disputes in a balanced way. Locke argued that individuals make a rational choice, rather than an emotional one, to form political societies, thus allowing them to avoid the vulnerability inherent in the state of nature. These groupings of individuals do so by empowering the state to enact laws that all are expected to obey, or ultimately will be compelled to obey. It is at this point that we observe some of Locke's more familiar qualification to Hobbes' social contract. Like Hobbes, Locke posits that societies are formed to promote the common good. To Locke, however, the common good is understood as the preservation of property. Nowhere is Locke more explicit when declaring that the preservation of property being the end of government and that for which men enter into society. While other laws are permissible, say for instance taxation laws, these must be aligned with the primary aim of society. In short, laws that infringe upon proprietary rights are presumptively suspect. Next, Locke also qualifies Hobbes' trade-off, arguing that a sovereign or state with absolute power is far more dangerous than individuals in the state of nature. The state, which possesses command over resources, institutions, and individuals, can wreak far greater damage than quarreling neighbors. Locke therefore insists that states be forbidden from holding any arbitrary power. Their authority must be circumscribed by law. As he declares, the ruling power ought to govern by declared and received laws and not by extemporary dictates, for then mankind will be in a far worse condition than in the state of nature. To sum it up then, Locke subordinates the sovereign to both the common good and to individual freedom, implying that laws which arbitrarily contravene either of these are, for all intents and purposes, not laws at all. It's important to note that Locke's position conflicts with that of Socrates, who insisted that the sovereign ultimately possessed absolute lawmaking authority. Our third theorist is 18th century philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Man is born free, stated in his book on the social contract, is effectively the basis of his philosophy. He argues that, in the state of nature, people are inherently free. Building on Hobbes and Locke, he also conceptualizes a social contract, declaring that, since no man has a natural authority over his fellow, and force creates no right, we must conclude that conventions form the basis of all legitimate authority among men. He describes the state of nature as a primitive condition, and that for our very survival, humans must change this condition through the formation of political societies. 
Well, this is no easy feat for, according to Rousseau, submission to a political society requires the abandonment of our freedom. And this is the very quality that makes us human. Now, Rousseau proposes a solution rather similar to that of Hobbes and Locke. Through an act of association, a group of individuals can create a collective body, united in a common identity and common will. Rousseau describes the act of association as a mutual undertaking between the public and the individuals. He declares, Those who are associated in it take collectively the name of people, and severally are called citizens, as sharing in the sovereign power, and subjects, as being under the laws of the state. To Rousseau, each individual effectively makes a contract with himself to be bound in two ways. As a member of the sovereign, he is bound to individuals. As a member of the state, he is bound to the sovereign. In a roundabout way, Rousseau makes the people, and by extension the individual, the ultimate sovereign, as they enjoy free will in deciding whether or not they wish to be bound at the outset. Like positivism, then, social acceptance is at the basis of the social contract. If there is acceptance of the association, then the individual is bound to obey the laws. If there is a rejection of the association, then no such duty exists. Of course, this begs the question, what happens to the individual who rejects the association? According to Rousseau, if an individual refuses to obey the general will of the association, they may be compelled to do so by the association. In other words, an individual is able to withhold their consent in theory However, in practice, they may be compelled to comply, or, in Rousseau's rather peculiar language, he'll be forced to be free, for this is the condition which secures him against all personal dependence. Ultimately, Rousseau intended for a collective morality, which is to be achieved through the social contract and public deliberation, to replace individual instinct and personal interest, which he believed were common to the state of nature. He believed that while the social contract may not destroy natural inequality, what it does succeed in doing is to substitute physical inequality, which is arbitrarily decided by nature, with political equality, which is agreed upon by convention. Now, the latter condition is clearly, at least to Rousseau and to many others, far fairer than the former. Our final theorist is John Austin. Before examining why we obey the law, the 19th century philosopher tackled an even more foundational question. What is law? Austin sought to draw a distinction between law and non-law, eventually conceptualizing a command theory of law. At the core of law is the command of the sovereign. This command is backed by a threat of sanction in the event of non-compliance. Like Socrates, Austin was disinterested in the substance of a law. To him, the source was critical in determining its validity, a determination that can be made based on facts and not values. For instance, whether Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act, which allows individuals to be detained for nine hours and subjected to questioning, is valid or not, depends not on the aim of the statute, allegedly to stop terrorists, or the efficacy of the power, this measure has or has not helped to minimize risks, or even the morality of the act, in this instance, an infringement on an individual freedom of movement, to Austin, these are value judgments, value judgments which are rather irrelevant to the analysis. What matters is whether Schedule 7 was enacted by the sovereign according to the correct procedures, and the state is backing compliance with the threat of sanction. The threat of sanction is most important and represents the standard by which Austin distinguishes between law and non-law. Pronouncement by a sovereign that non-compliance with a given law will elicit some form of sanction, according to Austin, gives law validity. Let's conclude with our opening question. Must we obey the law? According to our fourth theorists, obedience to the law, just like disobedience to the law, can be either prudential or moral. In the first instance, our choice is tied to personal interest, while in the second, our choice is linked to a form of intrinsic obligation, a moral duty. Both are valid reasons for obeying the law, just as, according to some theorists, both are valid reasons for disobeying it.